from the uh, outset of the war, Second World War in 1939, uh, Washington anticipated that, it, that the war would end with the United States in a position of overwhelming power, uh, high level State Department <coughs> officials and uh, non-governmental foreign uh, policy specialists uh, met regularly through the uh, wartime years. Uh, they laid out plans for the post-war world. Uh, they delineated what they called a grand area that the U.S. was to dominate. Uh, the grand area was to include at least the Western Hemisphere, uh, the entire Far East, and the uh, British Empire, which the U.S. was planning to take over, uh, including the U.S. Uh, uh, Middle East energy resources. Uh, the British Foreign Office was aware of this. If you look at their documents, not very happy about it, but they said <laughs> we're going to have to recognize that we're going to be a junior partner, as they called it, in the evolving wor world order. Uh, the, uh, well, that was in the early years of the, of the war. As uh, Russian forces started to grind down the Nazi armies after Stalingrad, uh, the conception of the grand area was enlarged to include as much of Eurasia as possible, including certainly the uh, industrial and commercial center, the heartland of uh, uh, Western Europe. Now, within the grand area, I'm now quoting, within the grand area, the US was to maintain unquestioned power with military and economic supremacy while ensuring the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with its global designs. That's a live policy right now. I'll come back to crucial instances. One should bear in mind how venerable the doctrine is and how appropriate to the nature of the world that was in fact emerging. You have to remember that when the Second World War ended, the US literally had half the world's wealth, a position of power of security that was totally unparalleled nothing like it in history, and that was understood. It's quite clear from the documentary record, I'm quoting now, that President Roosevelt was aiming at United States hegemony in the post-war world. That's quoting the British diplomatic historian Jeffrey Warner, quite an accurate assessment. And more significant, the careful wartime plans were uh, implemented uh, uh, in very much the terms uh, in which they were outlined during the war. They were implemented shortly after. Well, it was always recognized from the beginning that uh, Europe might choose to follow an independent path. Uh, NATO was partially intended to counter this threat. And uh, rather strikingly, as soon as the official pretext for NATO, you know, protecting Europe from the Russian hordes, as soon as that dissolved in uh, 1989, uh, reflexively, NATO was expanded. If anyone had believed the propaganda, it should have disappeared. Instead, it expanded. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened in 1989 is that a lot of clouds lifted. You could sort of see policy less concealed by ideology. So NATO was expanded to the east. Now, that was in violation of uh, verbal pledges to Gorbachev, which he was naive enough to believe. Uh, he was pretty irritated by it, but nothing he could do. And it's uh, since been expanded beyond. Uh, now it's a US-run global intervention force. And it has an official task. The official task is controlling the crucial infrastructure of the global energy system. That's quite an expansive role. And uh, that's what NATO is now committed to. Uh, the Grand Area Doctrine <laughs> Uh, limits uh, the sovereignty of others explicitly, but it grants the United States uh, unrestricted rights. That's what it means to be a global hegemon. And that was made very clear and explicit at once. Uh, for example, in 1946, uh, when the US uh, agreed to uh, world court jurisdiction, uh, but with a condition. The condition was that the United States would not be subject to any international treaties, meaning the UN Charter, the Charter of the Organization of American States, uh, uh, later the Genocide Convention, and so on. 
Uh, that, uh, th this has come up before the court repeatedly, and the court has accepted, and as it was required to do, the reservation that uh, none of these uh, treaties apply to the United States. Uh, the uh, principles also clearly license uh, military intervention at will, and that conclusion has been clearly not, not only implemented con continuously, but also pretty clearly articulated. And one tends to think of uh, the right-wing administrations, but that's misleading. Uh, one of the most expansive uh, f forms of the doctrine was under Clinton, in fact, Bill Clinton. The Clinton administration declared, quote, that the United States has the right to use military force unilaterally to ensure uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources, and must maintain military forces forward deployed in Europe and Asia in order to shape people's opinions about us and to shape events that will affect our livelihood and our security. That's actually much more expansive than the uh, much maligned uh, George W. Bush doctrine that came later. Uh, uh, the Clinton doctrine doesn't even require the pretexts that the Bush doctrine insisted on. But it was presented politely, so therefore it didn't uh, <laughs> arouse much uh, interest. Actually, the, the, the antagonism towards Bush was almost entirely style, not substance. The substance is pretty standard. Uh, the, uh, I think that's one of the reasons Obama was so welcomed in Europe. The style changed, not the substance. But, uh, uh, the same principles uh, uh, governed the invasion of Iraq. Uh, that became clearer as uh, uh, U.S. failure to uh, impose its, uh, its will became uh, clearer at that, as that proceeded. The actual goals of the invasion couldn't be concealed any longer behind uh, pretty rhetoric about you know, democracy and all sorts of nice things. Uh, in November 2007, the White House issued what it called a Declaration of Principles concerning Iraq. Uh, two main points. One was that U.S. forces must remain indefinitely in Iraq big military bases, right to carry out combat operations. And uh, secondly, that Iraq must privilege U.S. investors. Uh, two months later, January 2008, uh, President Bush uh, informed Congress that he would reject legislation that might limit the permanent stationing of U.S. armed forces in Iraq or U.S. control of the oil resources of Iraq, I'm quoting. Uh, the, uh, these are demands, incidentally, that the United States had to abandon shortly after in the face of Iraqi resistance as it had been forced to back off step by step all the way through. That's a major triumph of nonviolent resistance. Uh, the U.S. and Britain have no trouble at all killing insurgents. They're very good at killing people. But they couldn't deal with the mass nonviolent resistance, the hundreds of thousands of people uh, demonstrating and protesting. So they had to back off. And finally, the basic war aims were abandoned, articulated pretty clearly as they were being abandoned. Uh, that's uh, a major defeat, as uh, Jonathan Steele and other serious analysts have recognized. 